Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Anne says, I'm not uh, I'm going to talk about uh, automotive. I'm going to talk about a slightly different scale of uh, fuel cell. Uh, maybe Hugo should have come next, and he could have continued the automotive theme. But um, let me take you, Alf, into a slightly different place. Hopefully, it uh, hopefully it will be equally entertaining, and hopefully you will um, um, also think that this is uh, uh, a technology that is worth your consideration. So just a quick introduction to myself. I'm the CEO of AFC Energy. Uh, I have a number of other jobs as well around the hygiene space. I'm the president of the European Hygiene Association, and I also sit on the UK Hygiene and Fuel Cell Association board. Um, and for my sins, I spent 26 years in, that, in a big industrial conglomerate called Air Products, um, and eventually saw the light and came to a slightly smaller company, um, where we're still trying to use that hydrogen molecule a little bit more. AFC Energy is a, uh, an aim-listed company, and we're focused on industrial-sized fuel cells. And uh, hopefully I can take you through our, our business in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to look at uh, a little bit about disruptive clean tech, um, the industrial sector. I'm going to talk about alkaline fuel cells, because that's what AFC stands for, and that's what AFC makes. A uh, bit about business models and where we expect to get our revenue, and then where we're deploying our fuel cells. So I don't know, um, this morning's um, speakers, they probably covered some of these things, so apologies for not being with you this morning. Um, but fuel cells, in our opinion, will displace conventional power generation. And by conventional power generation, I don't mean car uh, engines, I mean big <coughs> gas engines, and I mean gas turbines, I mean steam turbines. So we're looking at a completely different scale of power generation. We're looking at megawatts instead of kilowatts, and we're looking at big industrial sites instead of something that you have to um, control or an environment you have to control in a public space. Um, obviously, from what you've probably heard this morning, you understand that fuel cells are more efficient. Um, they're quiet and clean, and they produce water rather than consuming it. But of course, you guys are also interested in economics. Um, so, what do we get out of these fuel cells? Well, we get power, uh, and the, that, that tends to be the most important constituent uh, export from a fuel cell. It probably has the highest intrinsic value, and is, um, it's that way because we can transmit it or transmit it to um, uh, lots of uh, different other locations where we can use it. But we do have a number of other products that come out the back end of fuel cells, heat, power, sorry, heat, water, and exhaust air. Now, these are only useful if, they are, if the fuel cell is locally sited to take advantage of them. Uh, but the benefits of heat from our fuel cell system can be quite significant. And um, the exhaust air is an interesting uh, opportunity as well for fuel cells, because um, the exhaust air of a fuel cell doesn't support combustion. So you can put a fuel cell in a place to provide power for, say, a data center, and then supply the atmosphere of that data center with the exhaust air from a fuel cell, and you will not have the risk of uh, fire that you tend to have in buildings that get quite hot in terms of um, the amount of power and PCs and uh, computing, time, computing storage that uh, tends to be used in data centers. Our focus is on industrial power generation, as I say. And we believe it's the largest market for fuel cells and uh, is, is forecast to be the most significant grower in this space up until 2020. What do we think that, where do the revenues come from? Well, obviously power pricing is quite important to those uh, revenue schemes. Um, and if we look at the UK, we're seeing prices somewhere between 45, right away up to 145, if you are just on um, localized grid uh, connections. If we look at Germany, we're looking at 100 euros if it's a CHP type system, but really we're focused on uh, locations a little bit further afield. And if we look at Korea um, with a feed-in tariff, we're looking at a significant uh, win for fuel cells up at $240 per megawatt. So we know that uh, we have a little bit of, a little bit of uh, work to do in order to compete with conventional generation. But, you know, fuel cells are good at identifying niches, but that limits their marketplace. And they're also good at taking subsidies, but that 
perhaps limited by funding and potentially limits their commerciality in the future. We don't compare ourselves to any other fuel cell system. We compare ourselves to conventional generation. We compare ourselves to a gas turbine, and if we're not competing with a gas turbine on a like-for-like -like basis, by 2016, we'll not have done our job properly. So I also want to go over this fact that fuel cells are, are new. They're not new. Um, the alkaline fuel cell has been, was it one of the first fuel cells that was invented, but it was primarily um, commercialized, if you like, by the space programs in the, in the US and Russia. Uh, it's the most electrically efficient fuel cell that you can bring to market. And we've seen applications develop from the space industry to the submarine industry and other um, military sectors um, over the last uh, number of decades. But we've seen that these um, systems are very reliable and have significant numbers of uh, operational hours on them. What we struggled with in the 50s and 60s was that we couldn't make them to be commercially acceptable on terra firma. And that's because the system costs uh, were too high. They, the, the systems that were taken to the moon had a high platinum content, and therefore the cost of those systems was far too high to actually warrant comparison to existing, manif existing generation techniques. And we also at that time had cheap fossil fuels. What we've done is we've taken that concept and taken a technology that is proven 50 or 60 years ago, and we've completely re-engineered it. We've brought to bear the material science that's been developed since the 1960s, um, some of which was only available to us in the, in the late 90s, to change the commercial offering of these type of fuel cells from something that is you know, out of court to something that is immensely commercial. We're taking that to the next stage now in our development as a company using, as you see here, modern materials and design techniques. But what, what sets industrial fuel cells apart from vehicle fuel cells, and we were hearing about those in the last, um, the last talk, is that we don't have the, the, um, the confines that a vehicle fuel cell has. You know, we don't really care what weight and size an industrial fuel cell is because we know we're going to have the space and we know probably we've got the site to be able to put it somewhere. We don't really need fuel storage because these fuel cells are going to be eating hydrogen at a vast rate. So we're not going to be storing the hydrogen, we're going to have an inline production process of it. We don't mind, because we don't mind how much space we take up, the power density can be slightly lower than those that we would see in a fuel, in a, a fuel cell driven car. And the safety systems are industrial, they're not public safety systems. So we can do working practices that are slightly different to um, those that we would see when we want the general public to interface with our fuel cell. And, you know, these, te these uh, offerings tend to be steady state. They tend to operate in one particular position. You want power normally most of the time. So uh, it's not like a car where you have to turn it on and off every time you get to a set of traffic lights. So our product at this point in time is a, a system called the Beta Plus. It's very simple. It's a modular design. Um, we can manufacture it very simply. Uh, and the installation costs and operation and maintenance are as low as we think we can get within this industry sector. We, it's important to note that we recycle 80% of this fuel cell. So it's not something where we build one fuel cell and that's it. We, we, we let it go to rack and ruin and then we have to buy another one. This fuel cell gets recycled. Most of the parts get reused. Most of the expensive parts get reused. Where we can't reuse them, we recycle them and upgrade them again. And we've already got systems in place where we can remotely operate and monitor the systems. Now, our near-term business strategy is to really focus on the chloroalkali market where there's significant volumes of hydrogen available, um, quite a lot of which is not put to any use whatsoever, some of which is put to low-grade steam production. Uh, and the rest is used maybe, mainly in the uh, industry that I used to work in, industrial gases. So having the available molecules is not a problem. 
What we're also targeting is other, um, other markets, and I have mentioned Korea already, but we are looking at to, to create a uh, network of partners where we have a number of early adopters showing off both ways of getting to different, uh, different routes to get to the hydrogen molecules with a fuel cell, but also different geographies where we want to interact. But I should stress, we do not want too many of these. The main reason for that is I don't want to overextend my small company. I want to have a set number that mean that I can support them and make those early adopters very successful. We also have flexible revenue models. And um, just looking at where we feel we are at this point in time, we're already uh, moving from our prototype field trials, where we have a system installed at Axo Nobel in, um, in Bitterfeld, through to our early adopter commercial demonstration um, take up. And we announced uh, a, a few months ago a relationship that we have with Industrial Chemicals Limited, who are based in West Thurrock in Essex. They will install the largest fuel, alkaline fuel cell in the world. They'll install the largest fuel cell in the UK, up to one megawatt's capacity. It will use all of the available hydrogen that's there on that particular site. And we class that as a demonstration project. We have, as I said, multiple revenue models. Um, so the company obviously looks to its investor community to provide some sources of funding. But we do take funding from another, a number of uh, different uh, opportunities that come uh, towards the company. And you know, we've executed licenses in recent times on the waste to energy marketplace with a company called Waste Atricity. That brings in money before we end up producing any fuel cells. So our fuel cells are designed for the future. We have existing relationships um, with multinational companies who are taking us through our technology curve, but also through our cost curve. And we are optimistic that we will roll out into a number of different marketplaces. And these, um, these relationships are all built around um, you know, an energy supply um, model rather than a sale of fuel cell model. I'm not really looking to sell my fuel cells. I'd rather keep them. I'd rather sell you the energy. And that, in the long-term scheme of things, will be much more rewarding than just selling the, the technology that produces it. So do we value shareholders? Well, we hope so. We do try and keep them engaged within our business. Um, we run a very tight ship. We don't, I, I'm, I have 26 years of Pennsylvania Dutch teaching that says you don't spend money lightly. AFC understand that now. It's taken them a little while. But they do understand that to actually spend any money um, at our company, they need to justify it. We have regular independent reviews of our technology. So we don't just say that our technology is good. We invite others to do that who understand where fuel cells are and the general state of the nation, if you like, in fuel cell technology. Mm -hmm. Don't take my word for what, I'm, for what this company is doing. Take somebody else's. I'll, I'm quite happy for you to do that. We have open days. We do broker research. Indeed, our broker is in the audience somewhere. I'm not sure where you are, John, but you're there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and we've got a lot of experience on our board. We have Sir John Sunderland sitting on our board. He was the chairman of Cadbury Schweppes for 25 years. Uh, he's a non-exec director of Barclays, although that's not necessarily the right thing to say today. <laughs> Um, we have regular updates on news, and we put lots of information into the marketplace. So in summary, we think that we have a very large market opportunity. We have a very modular fuel cell, and we can go after those, those market opportunities, whatever size they may be. AFC Energy is the global leader in alkaline fuel cells. This, this technology has not been looked at for some considerable period of time. Our retake on it, if you like, is allowing us to, to change the dynamics in industrial power generation going forward. We've got the lowest last lifetime cost of ownership, and we've got a project or a, a business plan where the implementation is underway. Now, yeah, we've got reference sites, and we've already, uh, last week or the week before, opened our initial pilot manufacturing process for our electrodes. This is happening, and it's happening in Surrey which is a bit surprising, really. I hadn't expected all of these things to be around. 
Uh, I've, I've been around uh, fuel cells for 10, 12 years now, and I looked at lots of different fuel cell companies. And the reason I chose to leave what was a secure job in air products and could have gone on for a very lot longer period was because this fuel cell company has tremendous potential. And I personally believe it will be one of the biggest fuel cell companies within the next five years. Thank you very much.